concerns more fully. Before we come to Prime Minister's questions, I'd like to point out that the British Sign Language Interpretation of Proceedings is available to watch on Parliament Live TV. We start with questions to Prime Minister Margaret Farrier. Question number one, Mr Speaker. Minister. Mr Speaker, can I start by wishing everyone a happy Burns Night, especially to those celebrating in Scotland. And Mr Speaker, as we prepare to mark Holocaust Memorial Day, I'm sure the whole House will join me in paying tribute to the extraordinary courage of Britain's Holocaust survivors, including 94-year-old Eric Hirsch, who is with us here today. This Government will legislate to build the Holocaust Memorial and Learning Centre next to Parliament, so the testimonies of survivors like Eric will be heard at the heart of our democracy by every generation to come. Mr Speaker, this morning I had meetings with ministerial colleagues and others in addition to my duties in this House, I shall have further such meetings later today. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Shockingly, one in six women in the UK have experienced economic abuse. This is not just about money, but the restricting of access to other resources like food, housing uh, or work. It's the lesser known aspects of coercive control that affects my constituents, the Prime Minister's constituents and every member across this House. What plans does the Prime Minister have to review in detail government departments and policies, uh, the way that government departments and policies can be exploited by abusers to ensure that these loopholes can be closed? Well, Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, the Honourable Lady raises an important point, and let me assure her that this Government is committed to tackling violence against women and girls. That is why we passed the landmark Domestic Abuse Bill, introduced new offences, for example, coercion, coercive control, stalking and others, and will continue to do everything we can to ensure women and girls feel as safe as they deserve and rightly should be. Michael Longy. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, While I was disappointed that Dudley did not make the final cut in the latest levelling up funding round, I am of course pleased that we received the £25 million Towns deal, the the brand new Duncan Edwards leisure facility and a transport interchange project secured since my election in 2019. But, but... (laughs) Our High Street, Mr Speaker, is on its knees. So will the Prime Minister meet with me and Dudley Council to discuss our levelling up bid and how we can ensure success in the next round? Mr Speaker, my honourable friend is a great advocate for his constituents. And And I'm delighted that, thanks to his efforts, Dudley has received £25 million from the Towns Fund. I know there will be disappointment about the levelling up fund, but all bids, including that made by Dudley Council, can receive feedback to strengthen their bid for future rounds of funding, and I would be very happy to meet him further to discuss. You now come the Leader of the Opposition, Keir Starmer. Thank you, Mr Speaker. This week we will remember the six million Jews murdered in the Holocaust and all those scarred by genocide since, as we mark Holocaust Memorial Day. We must all commit across this House to defeat prejudice and hatred wherever we may find it. To work for a better future, we must find light in the darkness. I can also join the Prime Minister in wishing everyone a happy Burns Night. Mr Speaker, Zara Alina was walking home from a night out with her friends when she was savagely attacked, assaulted, and beaten to death. Zara was a brilliant young woman, a trainee lawyer with a bright future. Her killer is a violent, racist, woman-hating thug, not fit to walk the same streets. But that's precisely the problem. He was free to walk the same streets. The inspectorate report into her case says that opportunities were missed by the probation service that could have prevented this attack and saved her life. Does the Prime Minister accept those findings? Minister. Mr Speaker, this was a truly terrible crime. And as the Chief Inspector has found the failings in this case, and indeed others, were serious and indeed unacceptable. In both of the cases that are in the public domain, 
These, these failures can be traced to failings in the initial risk assessment, and that's why immediate steps are being taken to address the serious issues raised. Keir Starmer. I'm glad he accepts those findings. The report also says that staffing vacancies and excessive workloads contributed to those fatal failures. And it makes absolutely clear this was not a one-off. As the report says, these are systemic issues in the probation service. They're clearly ministerial responsibilities. Does the Prime Minister accept those findings as well? Prime Minister. Mr Speaker, let me outline for the Honourable Gentleman exactly what steps we are taking, and that's to include and that's to ensure that mandatory training to improve risk assessments is being put in place. It's mandating checks with the police and children's services before a probation officer can recommend to the court that a convicted offender be given electronically monitored offence and implementing new processes to guarantee the swift recall of offenders. And the action we are taking is already making a difference. As for example, we see in the reduction of the number of electronically monitored curfews being given by the courts. Yes, Mr Speaker, it was Barking, Dagenham and Havering that tragically and fatally let Zara down. But across the country, probation services are failing yeah. after a botched, then reversed privatisation. Yeah. Yeah. After a decade of underinvestment, yeah. It's yet another vital public service on its knees after 13 years of Tory government. I spoke to Zara's family this morning. It's hard to convey to this House the agony that they've been through. They say that the government has blood on their hands over these failings. He's accepted the findings of the report. Does he also accept? What Zara's family say. Yeah, yeah. Prime Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, my heart, of course, goes out to Zara's family. He mentioned accountability. The probation services has taken action where failings have been found and where that has been appropriate. And with regard to the overall service, because of the extra investment we're putting in, there's now £155 million a year being put into the probation service so that we can deliver better supervision of offenders. There's also been an increase in the number of senior probation officers. But one of the other things we must remember, Mr Speaker, if we do want to increase the safety of women and girls out on our streets, that we need tough sentencing. And that's why this government passed the Police Crime and Sentencing Act, which the Honourable Gentleman opposite and his party opposed. In light of the case of... Zara, I really don't think the Prime Minister should be boasting no, about no. the protection yeah, that he's putting in place yeah, for women. Yeah. And I'm not going to take lectures from him about that. Does the Prime Minister agree that any politician who seeks to avoid the taxes they owe in this country yeah. is not fit to be in charge of taxpayer money? Yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, I'm pleased to make my position on this matter completely clear to the House. The issues, the issues in question occurred before I was Prime Minister. With regard, with regard to the appointment, with regard to the appointment of the Minister without portfolio, the usual appointments process was followed. No issues, no issues were raised with me when he was appointed to his current role. And since I commented on this matter last week, more information has come forward. And that is why I have asked the independent adviser to look into the matter. Now, I obviously can't prejudge the outcome of that, but it is right, but it is right that we fully investigate this matter and establish all the facts. Mr Speaker. He avoided the question. I think any, anybody watching would think it's fairly obvious that someone who seeks to avoid tax can't also be in charge of tax. Yet, for some reason, the Prime Minister can't bring himself to say that or even acknowledge the question. Now, last week, the Prime Minister told this House that the chair of the Tory party had addressed his tax affairs in full and there was nothing to add. This week, 
after days of public pressure, the Prime Minister now says there are serious questions to answer. What changed? Prime Minister, Mr Speaker, may, I, know, I know he reads from these prepared sheets, but he should listen to what I actually say. Since I commented on this matter last week, more information, including a statement, including a statement by the Minister without portfolio, has entered the public domain, which is why it's right that we do establish the facts. And, and Mr. Speaker, let me, let, me take, let me take a step back. Let me take a step back. Now, of course, of course, of course, the politically expedient thing to do would be for me, would be for me to have said that this matter must have been resolved by Wednesday at noon. But I believe in proper due process. That's why, that's why I appointed an independent adviser, and that's why the independent adviser is doing his job. But the opposition can't have it both ways. The shadow leader, his, also his party chair, both urged me and the government to appoint an independent adviser, and now he objects to that independent adviser doing their job. It's simple political opportunism, and everyone can see through it. We all know why the Prime Minister was reluctant to ask his party chair questions about family finances and tax avoidance. But but his his failure his failure to sack him when the whole country can see what's going on shows how hopelessly weak he is. A Prime Minister overseeing chaos, overwhelmed at every turn. He can't say when ambulances will get to heart attack victims again. He can't say when the prison system will keep streets safe again. He can't even deal with tax avoiders in his own cabinet. Is he starting to wonder if this job is just too big for him? Mr Speaker. Mr Speaker, the difference between him and me is that I stand by my values and my principles even when it is difficult. When I disagreed fundamentally with the previous Prime Minister, I resigned from the government. But for four, but for four, but for four long years, he sat next to the member for Islington North. anti-Semitism ran rife when his predecessor sided with our opponents. That's what's weak, Mr Speaker. He has no principles and just petty politics. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. For our most vulnerable children, school is often their principal place of safety as well as education. But as reported in my review of school exclusions for the government in 2019, the unacceptable and illegal use of off-rolling is still shutting a worrying number of children out of the classroom, out of learning and out of the protection they need from gangs, violence and domestic abuse. And whilst there has been uh, some impressive and excellent work done by the Department of Education to address this terrible practice, what more can my right honourable friend do to ensure that we now permanently exclude off-rolling from our schools. Yeah. Prime Minister. Well, my, uh, my honourable friend raises an important issue, and the government is clear that off-rolling is unlawful and unacceptable in any form, and the Department for Education continues to work with Ofsted to tackle it. Where Ofsted finds it, it will always be addressed in the inspection report, and it could also <laughs> lead to a school's leadership being judged inadequate. We now come to the leader of the SNP, Stephen King. Mr Speaker, let me start by echoing the sentiments of the Prime Minister and the Leader of the Opposition in relation to Holocaust Memorial Day. Truly horrific crimes that we must never forget and endeavour to ensure are never repeated. May I also send my heartfelt thoughts and indeed I hope those of all across the Chamber to the firefighter who is in serious condition in Edinburgh at this moment in time following the blaze in Edinburgh just a few days ago. 
Mr Speaker, may I ask the Prime Minister, what advice would he have for individuals seeking to protect their personal finances? Should they seek out a future chair of the BBC to help secure an £800,000 loan? Should they set up a trust in Gibraltar and hope that HMRC simply don't notice? Or should they do as others have done and simply apply for non-DOM status? Yes. Prime Minister. Yes, sir. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, let me share with the honourable gentleman expressing my sympathies to the families and indeed the firefighter who is currently in hospital. I'm sorry to hear that and wish him a speedy recovery. Uh, Mr. Speaker, I'm proud of the record of this government is supporting the most vulnerable in our society. Just this winter, helping all families £900 for their energy bills, raising the national living wage to record levels and ensuring that our pensioners get the support they need. That's what this government is doing to ensure financial security in this country. I'm not sure what question the Prime Minister thought I asked, but that certainly was not it, Mr Speaker. But let's, let's be clear about this. This is now a matter of the Prime Minister's own integrity and accountability. Yeah, yeah, After all, yeah, yeah. when there was questions about the Home Secretary, the Secretary and concerns about her role in relation to national security, he chose to back her. Now the Chair of the Tory party, he's choosing to back him despite Crazy. a five million pound penalty yep. from HMRC. And of course, he's seeking to protect the former Prime Minister despite his cosy financial relationship with the chair of the BBC. Is it little wonder that people in Scotland may well just consider the Tory party to be a parcel of rogues? Yeah. 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 Mr. Speaker, Mr Speaker, what I am standing up for is proper due process. That's why we have an independent adviser. It's right that the independent adviser conducts his investigation. That's how we will ensure accountability, and that's what I will deliver. Rob Roberts. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Wales has almost 40 times more people than England waiting more than two years for NHS treatment, despite having less than 5% of the population. Sad case of devolve and forget, unfortunately, which does a disservice to my constituents in Delhi. Could the Prime Minister confirm that the UK Government remains concerned about the health care of the people in Wales? And given that the North Wales Health Board has had it for eight years, could he come up with a way of putting the Welsh Labour Government into special measures? Yeah. Prime Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, as the Honourable Gentleman highlights, the NHS right across our union is facing pressure because of some of the challenges of flu and COVID in particular, causing high bed occupancy this winter. We are focused on delivering on the people's priorities and bringing down the backlog. We have currently already eliminated waits of over two years, and as the Honourable Gentleman says, there is more to go. That is why our investment this week into mental health treatment will ensure that we can ease the pressure further in a and &E, and I continue to delivering that across the country. So Jeffrey Donaldson. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, can I echo the comments of the Prime Minister in relation to Holocaust Memorial Day? And as we think of the situation in Ukraine, we also extend our best wishes to President Zelensky on his birthday today. Yeah, 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 yeah. Freedom of religion or belief is important in this country. Isabel von Spruce was praying silently outside an abortion clinic in Birmingham when she was arrested and questioned by the police, not about her written or spoken words, but about her thoughts. We value freedom of religion or belief in this country. Will the Prime Minister commit to examine the laws of the United Kingdom to ensure that this country remains a beacon for freedom of religion or belief across the world. Yeah. Prime Minister. Well, uh, Mr. Speaker, of, of course, of course, of course, we believe in freedom of uh, religious expression and belief in this country. But we also are balancing that with the rights of women to seek legal and safe abortions. That is currently being discussed in this Parliament. These matters are always matters of free vote, and I know members will treat them with the sensitivity that they deserve. Dr. Liam Fault. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Innocent civilians are being murdered in Ukraine on Putin's orders as we speak. And as we sit in a, 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 a warmed House of Commons, families are freezing because their electricity is being cut off by Russian forces. Putin believes that Ukraine is more important to him 
than the free world and is moving to a full war footing. So the Ukrainians must make gains on the battlefield, and the next six months are crucial. They need a full range of weapons, Mr. Speaker, air defence, artillery, longer range missiles and tanks, and enough to make a real difference. The UK has shown great leadership on this issue. Can I ask, therefore, my right honourable friend to use every means at his disposal, domestic and international, to honour the courage of the people of Ukraine and to defend the whole world order, because ultimately that is what we are really talking about. Yeah. 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 Prime Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, I have made clear that the UK and our allies must accelerate our efforts to ensure Ukraine wins this war and secures a lasting peace. Last year, the United Kingdom provided £2.3 billion in military aid to Ukraine, the largest package of support of any European nation, and we will at least match that again this year. And as my right honourable friend knows, last week I announced that we would gift many battle tanks as part of the next major package of UK support to Ukraine. And I'm pleased that our friends and allies are preparing to follow our lead. Dr. Rupert Hutt. Mr. Speaker, London has it all prime property, shopping, schools, even the perfect time zone for money laundering. And while there has been movement with Russian oligarchs, it's not just them. We know that there are relatives of regimes that we all condemn on both sides of this House that are running bogus Islamic centres just as fronts to stash their dirty cash, amongst other things. So when will the NCA be adequately financed so we can be a world leader in anti-corruption, as we promised in 2016? Or is there a lack of political will to upset the apple cart? Yeah, I well, well, Mr Speaker, the, the, the Honourable Lady should know that we are colouring the process of legislating the Economic Crime Bill, yeah. which, which puts in place many more measures to allow us to tackle some of the issues that she raised, and also introduces the Economic Crime Levy, which will provide considerably more funding to tackle economic crime in the UK. Mr McCartney. Thank you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Thank you, Mr Speaker. The Trans Pennine Rail upgrade is underway, which is good news. Um, with stations in Slowit and Marsden getting improvements. But what's not such good news, Mr. Speaker, is the dozens of daily rail service cancellations by Trans Pennine Express, which is causing absolute misery for my constituents, trying to get to work, trying to get to college, trying to visit family and friends. The franchise is up in May, Mr. Speaker. So, does the Prime Minister agree with me? Enough is enough. If Transpan and Express don't get to grips with this, we need to strip them of the franchise and get somebody in who will deliver the reliable rail services for my constituents. Well, Mr. Speaker, we have been clear that the current service is simply not acceptable. Rail North Partnership is working with a company on a service improvement plan, and my honourable friend, the Rail Minister, is having weekly meetings with them. As the Honourable Gentleman points out, Transpennine Express contract does expire in May, and whilst there are currently discussions about that new contract, if Ministers conclude that the operator cannot be turned around, then other decisions may be made. Olivia Blake. Thank you, Mr Speaker. From Rwanda to deaths in the Channel and the latest scandal of missing children, refugees and campaigners have today gathered outside Parliament to highlight the impact of the hostile environment on people in the migration and asylum system. Rather than cruel gimmicks like Rwanda, isn't the best way of deterring channel crossing, crossings, saving lives and breaking the business model of criminal gangs to introduce safe and legal routes to claim asylum? Well, Mr Speaker, this just is about fairness. It's about fairness for those that seek to come here legally. It's about fairness for those who are here and our ability to integrate and support those who we want to. What we will do is in break the cycle of criminal gangs, which are causing untold misery, leading to deaths in the channel. And that's why we will introduce legislation that makes it clear that if you come here illegally, we will be able to detain you and swiftly remove you to a safe third country. That is the reasonable and common sense approach that the vast majority of the British public supports. Oliver Hill. The Prime Minister will be aware of my concern that mental health patients should not be forced into accident and emergency departments when what they really need is specialist care. Can he say more about the extra money that is being made available for urgent mental health care? 
facilities and, and also what impact he thinks that will have first on the treatment of mental health patients but also uh, on the general situation in A&E departments. Prime Minister. My, um, my right honourable friend is absolutely right. People in mental health crisis deserve compassionate care in a safe and appropriate setting and too often they end up in A&E when they should be receiving specialist treatment elsewhere. This week's announcement is in mental health ambulances, crisis cafes, crisis houses and mental health urgent treatment centres will make sure that patients do get the vital help they need whilst easing pressures on emergency departments and freeing up staff time. My honourable friend is absolutely right to highlight this issue. Our announcement this week will make a major difference. As a trustee of the Holocaust Memorial Day Trust, this week, I was honoured to hear from Leah Lesser, a Holocaust survivor who came to this country by herself at the age of eight because her parents believe that the UK was a safe haven for vulnerable children. Yeah, yeah. This week, I also read the government's own statistics, which said that there are 200 asylum-seeking, unaccompanied children who are missing from hotels in the UK. Ministers have admitted that they have no idea about the whereabouts of these children. So could I ask the Prime Minister, does he still think that the UK is a safe haven for vulnerable children? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, Mr Speaker, the United Kingdom has opened up its hearts and homes to hundreds of thousands of people over the last few years, from Syria, from Afghanistan, from Ukraine, from Hong Kong, and provided refuge and sanctuary to many children in that process. But the reports that we have read about are concerning. Local authorities have a statutory duty to protect all children, regardless of where they go missing from. And in that situation, they work closely with the local agencies, including the police, to establish their whereabouts. And that's why it's so important that we end the use of hotels for unaccompanied asylum seekers and reduce pressure on the overall system. That's what our plans will do. James Dudridge. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Constituents in Southend and Rochford very much welcome the Energy Bill support scheme that's helped 99% of households uh, around the United Kingdom with rising fuel prices uh, despite Putin's barbaric war in Ukraine. Can the Prime Minister assure my constituents, and indeed this House, that he is committed to continue helping with the cost of living, not only this winter, but next winter? Yeah. Well, my uh, my honourable friend is absolutely right about this government's commitment to support all families with the cost of living. This winter, around £900 of support, but next year, as the energy price guarantee evolves, it will still be there to support families with around £500 of support. And this comes on top of record increases in the national living wage, worth about £1,600, and supporting our pensioners and the most vulnerable by inflating their benefits and pensions with inflation. Clive Bethel. Yeah. In 2021, the government enabled Yevgeny Prigozhin, former chef to Putin and founder of Wagner, to dodge UK sanctions to pursue a case in London against British journalist Elliot Higgins, who had exposed Prigozhin's link to Wagner. Prigozhin believed that silencing Higgins would get his sanctions lifted. The overriding of UK sanctions was approved by the Treasury when the Prime Minister was Chancellor. Prigozhin's English lawyers wrote that serving notice on Higgins, and I quote, will require Treasury approval. So what values did the Prime Minister apply when he allowed a Putin warlord to use our courts to try to silence a British journalist and undermine UK sanctions? Well, Mr Speaker, I'm proud of our record in leading, actually, when it comes to sanctioning those people connected with the Putin regime. I think at last count we sanctioned over a thousand people and frozen tens of billions of pounds of assets. I am aware of the case he's raised. We are looking at it. But there is, as he knows, OFSI, who deal with the licensing situations in these matters. But I'm happy to get back to him on the specific case that he raised. Nicola Richards. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Yeah, yeah, yeah. May I echo my right honourable friend's comments on the importance of Holocaust Memorial Day and welcome his renewed commitment today regarding the Holocaust Memorial and Learning Centre. Will the Prime Minister join me in encouraging members from across the House to sign the Holocaust Education Trust Book of Commitment, which will be in Parliament today and tomorrow, pledging to remember the Holocaust, fight anti-Semitism and support the important work of the Holocaust Educational Trust? Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. I thank my honourable friend, and as I said earlier, we will legislate to help build the Holocaust Memorial and Learning Centre next to Parliament to serve as a powerful reminder of the Holocaust, its victims 
and where prejudice can lead if unchallenged. I also join her in thanking the Holocaust Educational Trust for their fantastic work, and I join my honourable friend in encouraging all members to sign the Book of Commitment, as I will be doing later today. And this slaughter. Thank you, Mr Speaker. A week ago, my constituent, Ali Reza Akbari, was executed by order of the regime in Iran. In the three years preceding and the days following his murder, the UK Government made little effort to protect the life or protest the death of a British national. Tomorrow, Mr Akbari's family and I meet the Foreign Office Minister. They want to hear what help the Government can offer them at this time of their greatest suffering. Today, this House wants to hear from the Prime Minister what sanction he will impose on the regime beyond the trifling steps taken so far. First and foremost, will he show some courage, follow the lead of the United States and the European Parliament, and prescribe the entire Revolutionary Guard Corps as a terrorist organisation? Prime Minister. Yeah. Mr Speaker, the regime is prolonging the suffering of the family, and it is sadly typical of their disregard for basic human dignity. I have spoken before about my views in Iran when I was before the Liaison Committee, and Iran must now provide answers about the circumstances of his death and his burial. We have actually pressed the Iranian regime formally through their charge d'affaires in London and the Foreign Ministry in Tehran, and will continue to do so until the family get the answers they deserve and have sanctioned several members connected with the case. Redcliffe. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can I thank the Prime Minister and the Chancellor for visiting Hyman and Haslingen just last week to hear about the transformative difference that the levelling up funding will make. This is a historic investment with over £40 million secured. So does he agree with me that we're delivering on exactly what was promised in 2019 to the areas that were forgotten the most? like Hamburg and Haslinden, and will he visit once works are completed to see the difference himself? Well, my uh, honourable friend is a fantastic champion for her local community, and the result showed when the Chancellor and I were lucky to visit her last week. And as she pointed out, and as did many of the people that we spoke to, this was an area that been, had, had been forgotten neglected for decades, but it's this government that is putting in the investment, spreading opportunity, making jobs and making sure that people can feel enormously pride of the place that they call home. Mr Speaker, does the Prime Minister realise that uh, most people in my constituency think it's his role to keep our country safe? Is he aware that in all those years I've been in Parliament, I have never heard a situation where our army and armed forces are so run down that the chairman of the Defence Select Committee and the Secretary of State for Defence both say our armed forces have been hollowed out and are unfit to put a division into active service. What are you going to do about that? Yeah. Yeah. Minister. Well, Mr. Mr Speaker, the, the Honourable Gentleman seems to forget the fact that we've invested an extra £24 billion in our armed forces services. It's a record uplift in defence spending, ensures that we are one of the leading spenders on defence in NATO, and we will continue to ensure that we have one of the best equipped fighting forces anywhere in the world. And as we can see by the recent announcement on tanks, we continue to lead the world when it comes to standing up for not just our safety, but the safety of our allies around the world. Sir Michael Penning. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. And as of and as a former firefighter, the whole House will pray for the firefighter that's fighting for his life in Scotland today. Our emergency services go one way into the danger while we come the other way, and our thoughts and prayers should be with them. On a separate note, Prime Minister, the Coron Borough Council, the Conservative led council in my constituency, have done a fantastic job in building new houses, social housing, and council houses. Can the Prime Minister assure me that we're not going to be pushed into Green Belt any more than we have already, and we can protect the Chilterns in my constituency? Yeah. Yeah. Prime Minister. Well, Mr. Speaker, the honourable gentleman, uh, and I, I join him in praising his local council for ensuring that we build homes in the right places and make sure that our young people can uh, fulfil the dream of home ownership. But he's also right to say that this government will always protect our precious green spaces, uh, and the recent changes to our planning reforms will ensure that we can protect the green belt everywhere. And his local community and others will benefit from those protections as we keep our local areas beautiful. Martin Day. Thank you, Mr Speaker. UK in a Changing Europe has reported that at the end of 2022, 60% of voters said their cost of living had increased and 38% that their personal finances had been negatively affected 
from not being a member of the European Union. While OBR forecasts a 4% reduction in GDP, only two-fifths of which have already happened, surely the Prime Minister would agree with me, with the electorate and the experts that Brexit has only served to exacerbate cost of living and economic challenging facing these islands. Mr Speaker, uh, Russia's illegal war in Ukraine and the impact it's had on energy supplies has nothing to do with Brexit, Mr Speaker. But what we are doing is ensuring that we can support families with those cost of living pressures. That's why we provided £900 of support this winter with energy bills. That's why we're increasing the national living wage to record levels. And we will continue to stand behind Britain's families until we can bring inflation back down to where it belongs. Virginia Crosby. Mr Speaker, I know the Prime Minister will share my concerns at the news this morning that 730 people may lose their jobs at the Two Sisters Chicken Factory in Clangevny, one of the largest employers on Honest Morn. What support can the Government offer to both my constituents who are affected by this devastating news and the wider community at this difficult time? Mr Speaker, I'm very sorry to hear about the job losses that the Honourable Lady raises. My thoughts are with those affected and their families. I know how distressing that will be for them. Uh, you know, I'm pleased to say that DWP has procedures in place to support communities when situations like this arise, and we will work very closely with her to do what we are doing everywhere across the country, and that's provide good, well-paid jobs for everyone, because that is the best way to build a happy and secure life. Caroline Barris. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Exercise is essential for both physical and mental well-being, but with spiral energy costs, many venues, like the Freedom Leisure Centres in my constituency, are struggling to cope. While some sectors will receive extra support, the support and leisure industry will not. If the Prime Minister agrees with me that this sector is vital to the long-term health of our communities, why is his government not providing them with the financial support they need to thrive? Yeah. Prime Minister. Well, Mr Speaker, of course I agree with the Honourable Lady that exercise and leisure centres are important, and that's why we provided significant support to them during COVID and beyond. And with regard to energy prices now, the Chancellor has set out the new relief scheme that will run after the current one expires. It provides considerable support to all sorts of organisations up and down the country, and I'm sure it will benefit many businesses and organisations in her constituency. I understand that the case referred to by the right honourable member for Lagan Valley is currently before the courts. It is therefore covered by the House's subjudice resolution and should not be referred to in this House. It is, of course, open to any member to ask I waive the resolution in particular case, but that has not happened in this case and so therefore should not be discussed <coughs> at all. I will leave it at that. Right. Sends PMQs before I calls the urgent question.